first of ma'am thank you for inviting us to your lovely home to conduct this interview so uh, first of all how are you doing these days ma'am despite the problems in the country how are you doing hope we hope you are doing well i am looking at it in a very uh, positive way because i get to walk to my office which is just uh, 800 meters away from my home and i get to talk to the neighbors all this time we were wearing masks and now mm. we are sans <laughs> masks so i get to uh, talk to the neighbors to buy vegetables from the vegetable seller and and to observe the beautiful uh, fauna and the flora uh, that you get on, in the by lanes to so stop and look at the birds that sing uh, as w b yeats the famous uh, irish poet said what is life so full of care if you don't have time to stand and stare so that's what i have been practicing that's days. that's like that sounds like a very peaceful life <laughs> yeah so uh, our first question is uh, since you are a very famous person we all know that miss marni delivera is accomplished and everything we know all about what you did from your adult life to present mm. so but we don't know much about your younger days so yeah. would you like to yes. explain that i i was a, a very difficult child who would not conform uh, who would not fit into the mold i like to do things my way and uh, so so the school curriculum was a huge problem to me uh, i was very fond of uh, drawing and painting and uh, uh, i also liked anything associated with language and um, so lots of teachers could not understand me but uh, um i i i used to uh, do things in the way that i wanted to not not uh, what i was told to do uh, when it rained i used to go and um, jump in the puddles the other children used to uh, stand under the porch and look at the rain but i used to go and jump <laughs> into the puddles and slosh in the uh, uh, puddles and uh, that was kind of therapeutic because we have uh, you know whole series of serious subjects and and children need to experience the rain to listen to the sound of the rain and also i remember uh, uh, very vividly during english class we were asked to write about a coconut tree and everyone else was writing sentences and sentences and filling the pages of the exercise book i drew a huge coconut tree with coconuts falling on uh, someone's head and a little boy <laughs> coming and snatching a coconut and running away and asking his mother to make his favorite coconut sambal so uh, uh, i was sent to the school principal as a punishment and she never made me kneel down she asked why did you do this i said for me to write i i had to have the picture first in my mind and then on paper then i described the picture and i and i thought i will write better i would write a better uh, narrative essay than just write a oh, coconut tree is very useful it uh, the bark is useful yeah. to make furniture you can make uh, things out of coconut then coconut toddy rather than saying that i thought it's lovely to start it with a story that's really great not a lot of kids these days that yeah. want to do that they yeah i was in grade 5 so i remember that very vividly but the principal could understand me so so i thought this is what adults have to be right. like exactly. not like my school teacher but like my principal exactly. yes so as you were the, uh, the former chair person of the ncpa yes. yes. uh, you have seen a lot of child abuse yes. cases and all of yes. these experiences could you tell us like how bad is the condition in this country It, it is really we are looking for the child and come down to the level of the child and understand so because of that there are lots of unfortunate incidents and what i was most horrified was how children there are uh, uh, about 12000 20000 with different people give different statistics children in uh, so called child development centers or orphanages mm -hmm. And, and those children lead a very regimented life they don't have any love or affection they are just a number and from the time they are little babies still they are 18 they are kept there then suddenly at 18 they are put out and they don't know to how to handle themselves so those are the anti social elements and they are the people who commit crime or who harm themselves so it's a very sad situation because it is not a part of our culture uh, the orphanage system was introduced by the british and now the british themselves have abandoned it and they have foster care and alternative care family based care but still we are clinging on to it and people think it's a big thing to go to these orphanages and give uh, uh, 
these arms givings and all that, but the children are not happy because uh, they don't sit on their mother's knee and uh, uh, think about their dreams, future dreams. They're, 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 they're they have nothing to look forward to in life. No, they are very unhappy little beings. Talk about the child abuses and all of that uh, at the NCPA. So, uh, were you in the office or in the field working? I was rarely in the office. Uh, I used to uh, go to faraway village schools because I wanted to find out how the children function there and, and what kind of education uh, the, they were receiving because the only way out for those children uh, who, who are suffering out there is, is through their education. So we went to this uh, far off place, I, I can't remember the exact name of that village, but we had to turn off from Monragala and we had to go through this uh, elephant Right. In infested jungle, so uh, the driver had to buy a bunch of bananas, and uh, we had to feed the wild elephants on the way to for them to clear the path <laughs> because there were lots of herds right. of uh, big elephants and baby elephants, and we had to feed them uh, <laughs> bananas and then go to the school. So when I went to the school, you know, it was a very uh, rough uh, uh, clay type of right. uh, place, and the children were seated under a tree and waiting for me, uh, and we had taken some art materials mm -hmm. for them. Uh, lots of uh, white sheets of paper, bristle boards and uh, uh, crayons and paints. And uh, so I was racking my brains uh, on how I could interact with the children. So I told everyone, uh, I have some more nice uh, presence in the vehicle. Uh, can, can you draw a picture of where you will be in the future? So uh, they were drawing different things, but I saw a very beautiful picture of a teenage girl, uh, drew a person, a lady, and I, I noticed that the color of the sari was a sari <laughs> that I was wearing. I had some right. purple sari with the hot pink flowers, right. and the, the same thing was there, and the hair was slightly reddish. So I, I questioned her, and I asked her, now what have you uh, drawn? Uh, she said, uh, well, uh, madam, my future ambition uh, the principal introduced you as the chairperson of the National Child Protection Authority. My future ambition is to be the chairperson of the National right. Child Protection mm -hmm. Authority and look after the children and punish those who commit child abuse, to punish the perpetrators and to have a very good uh, uh, 1929 hotline and uh, go behind and uh, have an investigation and all, all what you said. I want to do for children. So, so I, uh, later on uh, at tea time, I asked the teacher and I said, uh, uh, I'm really surprised that this child in such a faraway village knew about the National Child Protection Authority. The teacher said, no, no, it's not that. Uh, when you came, you brought all those leaflets about the NCPA, about the NCP Act, and, and about the children's hotline. And then the kind of departments you have, the investigation unit, the psychosocial unit, uh, the legal unit, how you all go to court on behalf of child victims. So that this child was absorbing everything and it is the first time that uh, someone well known, even politicians don't come here because it's out of the way. They only go to towns and cities and they make a speech and go away. Nobody comes into this. So it is the only time that they had uh, seen a person of your caliber coming and explaining, uh, giving a job description of what they are doing at their workplace. So one of their first times to see what the outside world is like, like, what's happening, yeah, who is yeah. there for them. And at once she got attracted, uh, you know, to the kind of work that I was doing. Right. So now, so as so that kid wants to come to your position, then yeah, she's yes. old now. Yes. So, but now she's attending a village school. So that's very inspirational, but can they get that? Will they get the support that they need to get to that kind of place? Uh, let's take it step by step. Now she has to do her all levels right. and then she does her A levels. Then she gets into a university and then she specializes in child rights. She can do a child protection diploma or specializes in child rights. And then uh, she has to be appointed by the president according to the uh, National Child Protection Authority Act. The president has to appoint you to that post. Obstacles in their way that uh, yeah. uh, What I see in schools is right. you see so many vibrant, passionate young leaders at school level, but where are they? 
why aren't they in parliament why are they at uh, decision making levels why aren't they uh, leading this country steering the ship known as sri lanka to prosperity peace and joy where, where? why aren't they not there Be because of the harassment with because of the discrimination uh, because of the blocks because of the envy and the hatred that is there among peers uh, by their teachers the the, the harassment meted out to them by the teachers uh, by the school system itself so the school is a very uh, oppressive system to children that so many parents even in sri lanka i have noticed have opted for home schooling uh, even my two children suffered a lot at school they went to two leading schools but both of them but, but they were strong kids and they could overcome it but, but not every child can uh, you know fight that fight they don't get the support that they need. no so so we talked about people who have kids who have parents what about the Uh, kids who are in orphanages in first yeah. uh, although they are in orphanages or child development centers most of them have at least one parent but there is this mistaken belief that uh, if you send a child to an orphanage that child will get education i don't know about education but uh, it, it's very regimented it's, it's like a military atmosphere you are just a number there nobody right. will take you to uh, and and ask you Uh, or tell a story or ask you what your future ambitions are you don't get hugs or you don't get cuddles i have seen newly born babies you know who don't have eye contact with the uh, person carrying because they just clean up and put them then feed them and put them in the cots uh, so so that love and affection which is uh, very very of vital importance to a child's growth and development is not given to the child so when the child becomes a teenager and is let loose at uh, 80 they become horrible anti social angry uh, uh, young adults who who are very destructive and and who uh, uh, end up criminals and horrible nasty people so and do you think that how do you think that could be improved like especially yeah, compared no. to western countries yes now now this uh, orphanage system was introduced by the british but they themselves have discarded it they they have alternative uh, care and uh, family based care and foster care and things like that uh, which are totally uh, a far cry uh, from institutionalization of children so uh, i think like india india also has an alternative care policy we have an alternative care policy which was approved by the cabinet but is yet to be implemented so so uh, gradually we have to encourage people to go into foster care um, uh, e even though you have your own children you know, to get another child and you know uh, uh, give that child a nice home that's what they do in other countries uh, and and uh, try it out because we have a strong mechanism at grassroots level at divisional secretariats and at the district secretary we have a child protection officers we have women development officers we have psychosocial officers we have probation officers all those people can monitor these children who are sent back to the community instead of having them in a little chamber of horrors behind closed doors and regimented they can be out in the community enjoying life and being a part of the community they can be a normal person normal person and uh, living in a family here yeah. so that so that was this that was not our topic but we i want we wanted to uh, give a lot of awareness to it because yeah. not a lot of people think it's a big issue in this country so uh, thank you for elaborating on that uh, so on to our topic uh, about women's uh, rights in employment uh, so most of the time we have seen in sri lanka a number of women uh, are discouraged from entering the workforce what do you think that what do you think the reason for that is because in modern time yeah, yes it, it's a cultural barrier now even uh, when young lawyers uh, undergo practical training i have heard uh, the lecturer saying oh oh you can uh, uh, you know uh, learn about uh, writing deeds you can stay at home and you can use your computer on your dining table and you can write deeds you don't have to go out to work uh, so there there, there is this uh, perception that a woman's place is the home when i was little uh, i heard this uh, german saying woman space is kurka kirka kinder that is kitchen ch uh, church and children 
So, so that was the 19th century perception of uh, a woman's place. But here, here we are continuing it to the 21st century. So uh, lots of women are frustrated uh, because if by choice they want to stay at home, it's a different matter. But, but if they actually want to go out to work, uh, the avenues should be open. Um, you said by choice, so what don't you, what if the woman gets to that mentality because of the way she was raised? Yes. From the start itself, yeah. was thought you are like... You yeah, yes, yeah. that, that's what we were also taught, but I fought against that. Uh, I had a very loud voice, you know, they used to say, uh, little girl should be seen and not heard. Uh, we were made to write lines when we were small. So, so those cultural barriers, that's why gender is very important. I'm very happy that you brought it up because when I was a member of the National Committee on Women, we looked at the textbooks and they were horrendous, you know. Uh, father goes to work, mother is cooking, uh, Amara is playing and Sama is uh, helping mother to cook, uh, scraping coconut, you know, that kind of thing even in the school reading books. Uh, so, so gender, uh, uh, it's kind of it's not at, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. you're conditioned from a very young age by the school, home, and uh, mm -hmm. if this uh, bulb goes off, you know, it's a boy who has to get up. And if the girl, no, no, you're not supposed to climb. Someone knocks at the door after six, it's a boy who goes out, uh, but not the girl. Mm -hmm. If the boy helps the mother to scrape the coconut, oh, you go and study, <laughs> uh, let Nangi do it. So, so uh, all that, all those. Uh, gender sensitization mm -hmm. and it has to happen. It's simple table, it's the boy. It's, it's a boy, boy thing. Girls are not supposed to carry, they are not supposed to. So. But in the village, you see them, you know, uh, tapping rubber trees, you know, uh, carrying fish, huge baskets of fish when the shore comes and helping in the uh, paddy fields. Do you think that the uh, it also, like, women are discouraged from? the society and from the workplaces itself? Yes, the society, the workplace, the school, uh, the, 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 the environments that, uh, you know, keep the women uh, subjugated and, you know, uh, there's a very subtle form of discrimination, mm -hmm. you know, there's a glass ceiling, e even in schools. Now, the segregation of girls' schools and boys' schools also has contributed to that. And that's why uh, they go berserk when they are sent to universities. Yes. yes. And also, uh, Basically, when people, employers, when they look at people to hire, they go through like, oh, is this person married? Yes. Could you? Uh, yeah, could you yes. Uh, there's a lot of discrimination based on marital status because they think that, you know, you'll have to give maternity leave and uh, now there's a new act and it gives uh, extended uh, maternity leave. So, uh, uh, there's a lot of di discrimination of female-headed households and marital status, so which is a very sad thing. Again, it can be cured through sensitization, awareness, and empowering the women themselves. So there are laws to protect women. So there are laws. We have the perfect set of laws for women and children. But if we implement and if, if we find the impact of those laws and uh, correct the uh, implementation, uh, then it would be fantastic. Uh, so we have those laws, but Laws are there only in law books. There are places like, as I said, the uh, workplaces, they always try to get around. Yeah, there yes. are laws to protect them up, so we don't have to hire them. Yeah, yes, yes. Could, there are, there are ways of... prevent that from happening? How can we stop that? No, the women themselves have to demand and also there has to be a public education of the people at decision-making levels. Right. So, on to our main topic, uh, the, the previous question was just to give awareness on the child abuse thing yeah. and uh, so our main topic of the session is uh, women's rights in employment. So, so my question is, uh, most of the time we have seen in Sri Lanka number of women are discouraged, even in modern times, women are going to uh, going for jobs, but there are there are a number of women who are discouraged from their homes or other factors yeah. to there are lots of barriers. In jobs. What yeah. do you think is the cause of that? Uh, first, uh, the cultural uh, barrier. Uh, when I was small, I heard this uh, German saying that a woman's pa uh, place is Kurka Kirka Kinder uh, in German. Mm -hmm. uh, that means uh, church, kitchen, and children. So, so uh, that was the 19th century. Uh, perception of women in uh, Germany, in Europe, but, but still it, it, uh, it, it, it reflects the mindset here. 
because uh, uh, even at a legal training program, when young lawyers were being trained just before they took courts, uh, one of the lecturers had said, uh, oh, uh, we are teaching you how to write deeds because you can stay at home and you can have the deeds on your computer and you can write. You know, so the woman's place is the home and, and not outside. So, so, yeah, yes, so cultural uh, constraints. And, and the other thing is, uh, it's not safe. Uh, public transport is not safe. Uh, there's a lot of harassment in public transport and there's also harassment at the workplace. So, so women are reluctant. Uh, once they have uh, the first nasty experience, you know, they stay away. And the other thing is, uh, when they enter the job market, now I had uh, uh, encounters with two young people who, went for, who applied for a job in a leading uh, government institution. Uh, there was a lot of jealousy because uh, they were very fluent in the language, they were accomplished, they had done debating. Uh, so, so the seniors did not like them to come. So, so there is inequality of opportunity. Also, uh, there's a lot of discrimination against married women because they mm. think that uh, they'll become pregnant and uh, you know, they'll have to give them maternity benefits. So, so uh, uh, unlike in other countries, ma married women are discarded. And also with regard to rural women, women outside the, uh, the main cities have problems in accessing employment, even if they are very clever. And uh, when they are at school, I have gone to some of these rural schools when I was the um, chairman of uh, NCPA, you, you get such fine uh, b girls and boys with leadership qualities, but what happens to them? There, there are some unseen force that is crushing them before they emerge from their uh, cocoon. As you said, uh, married women don't get much opportunities in the workplace. Yeah. Uh, why do you think, like, uh, what, can, what can we do to that's a that. very good question Be because I uh, rehabilitate and, and I give income generation training to women, to survivors of violence and uh, most of them when they come to me, now their husband has been the breadwinner but they have had a huge problem, violence, if family violence, man has hit them and she has come out of the house with her children. So the first thing I ask when she settles down is what do you want to do for my future? I said, oh, I did my A-levels, but I didn't go to university because I got married and my husband didn't let me. Uh, can I do an external degree or can I do a diploma, which is a stepping stone to a, a degree? So, so there should be continuing education. Even at 50, you should be able to do your yes. A-levels. Or uh, at, at 18, you should be able to do your doctorate. You know, uh, these avenues should be open and uh, it shouldn't be very costly and uh, uh, we should encourage, the, because we have an aging population now, we have to encourage people to uh, continue with their education. Because then only they'll be productive citizens, otherwise people will be looking up and waiting, and then they'll get sick and there'll be a huge burden on the economy. When in your idol. I have seen like in several places, even in media I think, like people when they're hiring employees, they look at their Civil status: Are they married? Yeah. Do they have kids? So yeah. I think that should. And, and also the age, uh, ageism, exactly. is, is, yes. is also you shouldn't discriminate if, if you are capable because the best years are uh, after sixty when you retire. So uh, you have all that experience, and, and for you to just time. look up and uh, wait. So so you have to. That's called active aging. You have to employ those people, even if you have retired from government service. They they should be channeled to some other mm -hmm. uh, lucrative uh, and. Uh, productive area. Exactly. So, uh, as we talked, you said about women's ability to lead. So, uh, what do you think would improve that thing, like that stigma that women can't lead? What do you think we could? Uh, uh, yes, that could be done. Yes, that's a very good question because uh, we can have role models. Now, uh, recently, I had some girls coming to me, some survivors of violence from a very, very rural area, and. Uh, the day they, that they came, uh, I, I went to meet them in my, in my court attire and I explained, I'm sorry, I, I was in court, you know, I had to come to that. Uh, so, so in the evening when we were having a discussion and uh, first we, I got the children to draw uh, what they wanted to be when they were, at once she drew a lawyer and she said, this is my future ambition because she had never seen in her rural setting, she had mm -hmm. never seen anyone like that. 
and uh, in the same way uh, i used to go to rural schools when i was chairperson of ncp and i had to go to one school of monragala i had to feed the elephants bananas to go go through that road uh, you know to get them uh, 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 away from the road uh, to go to that school and and when i went to that school uh, i asked the children where we do you like to be in 10 years and then someone drew someone uh, the same color of the sari as me and and uh, then we asked them to explain their pictures said i want to be the chairperson of ncp <laughs> because then i asked the teacher and the principal principal said even a politician hasn't come to this school because it's so rural it's in the middle of a jungle so you are the only big person that they had seen you know and and, and when you explained about your work and about the act, ncp act uh, they got very interested and thought oh Uh, you know i also can aspire to be someone like that, that that's very interesting <laughs> that you said that because people do get inspired to get to those big places because they've never seen people like you mm-hmm. but they want to be that but could they like yes, do they get this of course of course you, you need only one teacher at school to help you right. uh, to do your a levels then one lecturer at university to encourage you and and then when you're out there uh, you have to spot the people right. you know who 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 will uh, hold your hand yeah. and lead you to to where you can go and that's what i try to do with the younger generation that's why i was very happy when i heard that the university students were coming to <laughs> <laughs> have a chat with me today and then um, so now we are in a very developed world even though sri lanka is kind of back yeah. but uh, we all know that women nowadays are better off than women yes, yes, 30 50 years ago so uh, do you think like in what ways have women have become better off in terms of employing finding employment uh big because uh, we were the first country uh, to sign uh, cedo that is convention against the elimination of discrimination of women so after that uh, after we signed uh, the international treaty uh we took on legal obligations and uh, we set up a women's bureau in 1978 and then a women's ministry and and uh, then we had national action plans uh, and 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 we had all these uh, officers at village level women development officers at every pradeshya sabha and every district secretariat we we have those uh, women development officers who work with women to encourage them to train women in income generation activities so 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 that that mechanism was put in place and and then people started talking about women's rights and and the rights of the girl child so uh it it has been better than than what it was uh, immediately after the victorian era we were really backward uh, it has been better but not good enough uh, so the law enforcement machinery uh, needs to be well oiled and and uh, otherwise uh, you know uh, the laws might be there in the law books but un- unless it is implemented and and you get the uh, desired result it's it's useless so there there are laws covering it but nobody really bothers to, to uh, enforce no, and, and enforce and implement and see that the perpetrators are punished and uh, use the laws as an educational tool if you don't do this you would go 10 years to jail you know that kind of thing that uh, public awareness and uh, education sensitization is not there why do you think like those institutions don't bother with such cases like is uh, it again that's a good question because they don't employ passionate people right. sri lanka sadly is not a meritocracy right yeah uh, so so if, if you are giving a job at national child protection authority it has to be Uh, someone who is passionate about child rights who who go who will fight who will do everything possible uh, to to save a child who is suffering exactly so means you were talking about uh, women uh, when it comes to employing women like especially women who are married you said that there should be people there should be a, people should be educated and all of that so uh, and the best another good way to get help women out is to have women in power so uh, what do you think uh, what are the factors do you think would impact a woman's ability to be first of all she has to believe that she she can do it and and uh, e- even if there are obstacles and obstructions uh, she should forge ahead right yeah. so empowering yourself is the most important like 
also what do you think would be an obstacle for them like right? the cultural barriers uh, uh, what people say uh, and, and and the harassment from uh, from various people from home even traveling if it's a problem for her if she has to travel from here to candy and in the bus uh, she gets sexually harassed and uh, then at the workplace especially if she's leading somebody yeah way. yeah so you have to be very thick skinned uh, very confident uh, sure of yourself and and able to ignore and just carry on since you have founded your own organization sisters and law sisters and law so in, the, in that you handle cases with women being harassed yes. so do you get cases like yes women in employment who have yes lots lo, lo, lots of cases uh, recently there was a, a young girl it was her first job and uh, she had to go with her boss who was very good uh, mm -hmm. when, when, when she was at a normal workplace but she had to go out station and she had to do a presentation mm -hmm. and to prepare the slides he had asked her to come to the room so she she was uh, happily going with her laptop and then he had asked her to place a laptop aside and try to molest her and when she tried to tell the hotel people they didn't take any notice and then she called her friends and uh, she went and told the police uh, they had said you have no marks on your body so we are not going to but the sexual harassment provision in the penal code uh, says even verbal or even a text message you can go to jail for 5 years and uh, the victim can ask for uh, compensation so so this is how the law is implemented so law is there but they don't really yeah. care about it yeah so when when you take on a job you cannot tell i i cannot go out station i cannot you know you can't uh, put down those conditions so so the environment has to be conducive and uh if uh, the perpetrator oversteps uh, is the boundaries then then the uh, victim should be able to uh, take action but because the law enforcement machinery is not working uh, then it, it becomes a huge problem so basically the even the people in at law enforcement they should be trained they, they, they should be educated even even i train the police I have done so many trainings. At trainings, they are very nice. We do all this in the form <laughs> of role play. We get this. He would six foot a policeman to be a victim, and then say, "Oh, I was harassed. Uh, you know, I was swimming in the sea. I was a foreigner, and then this man came and touched me." And uh, you know, they show a lot of sensitivity at the trainings. But when they are at their workplace doing the job, you know, they can't be bothered. And and step by step, they have been given by a former IGP what to do in this. sexual and gender based violence cases how how you write down a complaint how you conduct an investigation none of that is adhered to they have circulars and circulars on these things but uh, your organization helps you when yes case. yes we give them uh, legal advice we prepare their documents we appear on behalf of them in court we uh, from magistrates court right up to supreme court uh, we do their so they do case. have a safety net yeah. yes yes but after it has happened i'd rather that you know prevention is better than cure yeah but uh, so most of as you said most of these a lot of these cases are with the boss and the uh, subordinate boss and the subordinate peers uh, or a driver in the office van it Do you can think be anyone since it can be like would the uh, victim would they be kind of i don't know if the explicitly or implicitly would they bottle it up without telling me yes body. yes uh, now as you said earlier it's if it's between the boss and the subordinate it's a question of power and control yes. so so uh, your promotions will yeah. be affected your increments will be affected uh, so uh, if you really want to keep your job if you really need the money and you have to keep the job and you have to show the outside world oh i'm doing this good job Uh, they might end up bottling it up so then how the, can that be illegal like how what is the solution for that? Uh, uh, again it depends somebody yes uh, uh, now uh, uh, in other countries they have anti sexual harassment policies and they have committees set up in every organization where you could make a complaint or you could make a uh, uh, anonymous complaint and then and then 
they watch the situation and that kind of thing. Uh, support systems are within organizations. Yeah, and uh, as a lot of us have heard of cases in internationally, women are speaking out against yeah, their yeah. employers, but that doesn't happen here because... Uh, because uh, these anti-harassment committees are not set up. So, so when you set up that committee, you tell everybody in your organization, if this happens, you will have to face the consequences. So, so here, here there is a lot of impunity, so nobody cares, you know, you can get away with it. And also the woman might think it would be a she or something. Yeah, yes. Uh, and, and in other, other jurisdictions, she has a huge support network. You know, if she falls into trouble, here uh, women's movement is also very fragmented and, you know, women's organizations even don't work together. So, so that's a huge problem. We all know that times have changed. Even Sri Lanka has progressed to an extent. So we know that people, women who entered the workforce back then, like let's say 30 years ago, didn't have it as good as women now. So how do you think it has changed? Like how has it changed for yeah. people? So, so these Victorian values came in the 19th mm -hmm. century. Uh, so little by little uh, we have changed. And, and the major change uh, took place uh, the Convention Against the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, uh, which is the International Bill of Rights for Women. It's an international treaty. So when Sri Lanka was one of the first to sign it, we signed it in 1981, and we were one of the first to ratify it in Asia. So we take on legal obligations when we sign uh, that, that uh, you know, women will not be discriminated, uh, rural will, women will be helped, women can take part in politics, uh, there won't be discrimination in marriage, that's a draft system and all that. So uh, we have taken on legal obligations and every four years we have to report to the uh, CEDAW committee uh, in the UN and the measures that we have taken uh, to implement uh, rights of women in our country. So, so, so they set up a women's bureau in 1978 and then uh, in the 1980s there was a separate women's ministry, then there was a national uh, committee on women, then there was a women's charter, a policy document. Uh, so all those structural uh, changes, those mechanisms uh, happened. Uh, but it's very sad that the, they lack teeth and, and they are not implemented properly. Uh, so uh, you're saying it has regressed? Yes, it has. And you think that has changed positively? in these, like, let's years, anything that has... Uh, the, the, the women themselves are, are more uh, confident and passionate. The, more, most of the young girls, the women themselves are very outspoken and they communicate uh, if, if they are given a chance and if they have had that exposure. They are more confident. Yes. Even the women who come to me, you know, uh, when, when I give them that confidence and when I, when I speak to them and explain and uh, the plus points in, of the situation, you know, they rise to the occasion. Anything that you have noticed in the workplace itself in terms of how men and women work? Yes. Uh, what I uh, find absolutely disgusting in, in our uh, Sri Lankan workplaces is uh, how, how women are uh, treated as objects and uh, as toys, you know. They laugh uh, at, at them, the way they walk, the way they dress, uh, the shape of the body. Uh, they call them names like Badua, Kal, and that kind of thing, which you don't get in other countries. Mm -hmm. there, there's a lot of respect and uh, uh, the, the right to uh, dignity is, is respected. Uh, among both sexes. Uh, now here, uh, they run down uh, women and they speak ill of women and they mock. So, so it's not necessarily uh, physical abuse or e economic violence. It, it can be verbal and very subtle form of emotional abuse, which, which can be, uh, uh, there's a writer, Amina Hussain, who has said sometimes there is no blood. You know that uh, psychological abuse it is more painful than physical violence. It lasts longer. It lasts longer because you can't see it. Uh, it's not like an open wound where you have been beaten up and you can see it here. And, uh, so we've been talking a lot about systems. Are there any 
uh, current laws or regulations that can that lead to a reduction in harassment, like that are, in, that are already enforced, not just in theory, that are already enforced. Are there laws like that? Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, now the constitution. If you take the constitution, the preamble or the introductory paragraph of the constitution says, "This is a democracy." Now, in a de de democracy, has very, very, very wide connotations. In a democracy, there has to be a free and independent media. So, 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 a woman who has been uh, continuously harassed can can go and tell the media, okay. But, but here, I see they only sensationalize a story, and uh, only for that day they show it on. Uh, uh, they show the victim on uh, television, they, they talk about it for about two weeks and then it dies and it. No, you have to follow it up, right? Right from the uh, commission of the offence, uh, whether they got, whether the justice was meted out by the courts or not. Right up to that point it has to be followed up, but the media loses interest the moment another story comes and they sensationalize it. So, in a democracy, there should be a powerful media, powerful and independent media, independent judiciary, so the judges have to be trained. There are some excellent judges. Others have to be trained uh, to be sensitive, uh, to have empathy for the person who has come before court, because that person might be a poor person, might be an ignorant person. But you have to go halfway, and uh, and you have to and you have to have very creative lawyers, you know, who who, who use these uh, laws that are just lying dormant in law, law law books and create magic out of it, and 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 uh, give the result that the uh, a grieved person wants to have, and and then we should have uh, a very vibrant civil society who gives support to this uh, person who has suffered violence. So, so so all those things have to be uh, have to come into play in a very vibrant, healthy democracy, uh, which we don't have. Democracy is only a label on our constitution. So now we are nearing the end. Um, how do you? Since you talk so much about the uh, drawbacks of these systems, how do you expect the laws and regulations to change over the next like, five, ten years to encourage more women to work and how it would be a better environment? I, I think uh, the system of legal education has to be changed drastically in this country. Uh, we, are, we are just writing uh, assignments, we are, we are just asking questions and you memorize and you go and regurgitate at the exam. That's not good enough. It has to be taught out in the field. You, you have to uh, ask them to observe a case and, 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 and then you have to be questioned on that. Uh, so that they have to think on their feet. Uh, wh what are they doing? They are, uh, at law college, the notes are being photocopied and sold in some canteen and uh, they, they, they come and vomit it out at the exam. That's not how you train lawyers. So, so those are the lawyers who become judges. So, so uh, there has to be a very creative legal education system and also the other people, the non-lawyers also have to be uh, sensitized on democratic values, on what rule of law is, on what people's sovereignty is, uh, on international standards, on ethics on uh, morals, uh, on, on, on everything, you know, everything is not, not a law, but there are certain things that are not done. If, if a uh, old person is crossing a street, a busy street, uh, the law doesn't say for you to help that person. But, but, but as a uh, morally upright person and a, and a good person, good citizen of the country, you help that person. So, so those values uh, which have disappeared, those, those uh, community values, those wonderful. The value education is not there. As I told you before, too much of emphasis is given on exams and getting jobs. Uh, that humanness uh, is not inculcated in the children. The parents are not doing it, the schools are not doing it, the society is not doing it. And uh, this is just to educate our younger audience. Um, and most of the audience are university students. In, uh, in one or two years, they will be entering the world series. So what do you think, like, uh, what are your thoughts on how we can handle bullying towards women or men in the workplace? Like, if a person sees that happening, what should they do? They, they should, uh, the person who saw has to f form himself or herself into a network and first go and speak to the person who was affected and, and, and then 
they have to uh, separately and, and calm her down or him down and, and then speak to the perpetrator and say this is not acceptable. I know you made a mistake, we have made mistakes but, but from next time can you apologize and can you stop doing what you are doing? Then it will stop at that because there is a huge crowd coming and telling and he is cornered. Right. You know? And, and say, we are, we are the real guys, not you, my dear. And for you to be a real guy, you have to stop doing this. Any other places they can go to, any other sources of help they can... Yes, the students have to form themselves into that uh, support centers. You can't have a label and say she's a counselor because they'll go to sleep. They'll do, just do it for the salary and uh, not come. And that's what happens in schools. They say there are counselors, but uh, it, it doesn't work. So the children, the peer group has to you know, give that kind of support, that warmer. And our last question, um, what would you, what kind of personal personal advice would you give to a young person entering the world? Yes, uh, I, I would like to uh, say what uh, a former uh, High Commission of Human Rights has stated, that this is all about human rights and duties. Because human rights uh, did not come with uh, Eleanor Roosevelt in 1948. The seeds of human rights were sown by the major religions of the world. The right to dignity uh, came from the Islamic and Christian belief that man or woman is created in God's own image and likeness. Non-violence, avihimsa, came from the Buddhist principle. Uh, compassion, maitriya, dhana, to give, to, to help the needy. So, so all those are beautiful religious concepts. Then the Dharma, uh, Dharma means virtue in the Hindu uh, uh, religion. So all, all these, the right to dignity, uh, compassion, um, abhimsa, uh, Dharma, all, 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 all were collected and, and made into, codified into this human rights documents, which Sri Lanka goes and ratifies, and Human Rights Commission, and we have it in our constitution as a chapter. So, uh, if, if we are to find solutions to the problem, we have to respect the human rights of others, and we always speak of human rights, but we don't speak of duty. Duty is written in a small paragraph in our constitution, and says so you have to duty towards the environment, you have duty to uh, do this, do that. But human rights and duties, a sense of duty has to be taught from the time you are young. You have a duty to uh, protect the environment. You have a duty uh, not to be cruel to animals. You have a duty to look after the elderly. You have a duty uh, to respect the rights of others and not to uh, cause violence to others or not to destroy their property or not to, uh, not to hurt them in any way. Uh, it goes hand in hand with human rights. I have human rights to express myself. You also have a human right to express yourself. I have a human right uh, to uh, get higher education. You also have a human right. But I cannot block your your, your, your right to, to, to get to the place where I want to go to just because I want to educate myself. So, so that's where we have failed. So the answer is in human rights and duties. And, and that will lead to peace, joy, and prosperity that we all crave for. We all want to, to have peace and calmness, no, not violence, <laughs> not aggression. And then we want to be happy. We want to be smiling, we want to be happy, we want others, others to like us. We, and, and, and we want to be prosperous, not in need. So all that will come if we respect, if we do our duty and if we respect the human rights of others. So it's very simple. That is very good advice, Ms. Marini. Uh, so that concludes our interview. So thank you very much for agreeing to participate in our event. And uh, thank, thank you, you very, very much. much. Thank you for inviting us to your home to do this. And uh, uh, it has been such a pleasure uh, to see university students going out of the classroom, out of their lecture theater, and coming out uh, into the real world and, and uh, establishing networks with us. So let this be the beginning and not the end. Thank you. And thank, thank you, you for watching.